I'm excited to welcome you all to the museum on this celebratory opening day of our groundbreaking exhibition, Regeneration, Black Cinema, 1898 to 1971. <laughs> Today's special behind the scenes presentation, we will learn about the curatorial process of creating this in-depth exhibition about black participation in American filmmaking, highlighting the works of African-American filmmakers and so much more. It's my honor to be introducing today's guest responsible for bringing this, this exhibition to life. Um, Vice President of Curatorial Affairs, Academy Museum Motion Pictures and co-curator of Regenerations, Doris Berger. <laughs> Director of Curatorial Affairs, Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery and co-curator of Regeneration, Dr. Rhea Combs. Assistant Curator, Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, Raul Guzman. Please join me in giving our guests a warm and congratulatory welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. So Thank you for coming. excited to see everybody here. Thank you so much. We are so delighted for you all to be here today and for us to have a chance to give you a little insight into our project Regeneration Black Cinema 1898 to 1971, which was an amazing journey for us together uh, that took us uh, into many, many different archives, as you will see, but also took us about five years. <laughs> to to travel together, so to speak. So, <laughs> um, we have prepared some images for you that we've collected throughout our process, and we would like to share with you today. Um, and we all will be speaking at different moments in time of our presentation. And after our presentation, we have the chance for your questions. Please ask many questions. We hope we can answer all of them. And we look forward to our lively afternoon hour today. All right. We wanted to start with a slide and a quote by the wonderful James Baldwin, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. That quote and that thought was really deeply motivating for us and really important for us as we have created the exhibition Regeneration, because we believe only when we know our history better, we can understand our present better and can work on a better future together. And for us, this was like a guiding force throughout the entire project that um, we had this sentence with us all along um, and, and that we wanted to share that with you. Like sometimes you need like a, a key thought that you have with you throughout the project. And for us, it was, of course, James Baldwin, <laughs> who else? But that quote in particular was really meaningful to us. And the image, the image is from 1898. It's Something Good Negro Kiss. And this is a work that really sort of also anchored everything that we did because it's the first known moving image of uh, black participation in film uh, that we were able to identify. We know that this is uh, two vaudeville performers, uh, Saint Subtle and Gertie Brown. Uh, and vaudeville and theater was critical um, in at this at the sort of end of the 19th century. This was many ways that uh, black performers were able to and um, get work and act and uh, and have opportunities. So to see these two performers in these wonderfully smartly dressed outfits, um, sort of playing out this um, you know um, skit uh, that was based off of the 19 uh, of um, um, Thomas Edison short called The Kiss, and they're doing sort of an African American, the black version of that. We thought was really also. Um, a great way of anchoring what we, the way in which we looked at this work. And also that shows already 
1898 and we have a quote from 1980 mm -hmm. that brings together different time zones, if you will. And we are living in 2022 now um, and we started to work on it in 2017. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many time zones and they're all important of how they come together, how we experience life uh, and our histories. Uh, a little bit of history of the project and the Academy Museum. Um, well, you all might know that we built this museum recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we started to work on this project, the museum was in production, in construction, uh, literally. And you see here a photograph, or some photograph from, I believe, 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah your yeah. first visit. Yeah. Um, where Ria visited from DC. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, at that time, was working at the National Museum of African American History and Culture when we started to work with one another. Mm -hmm. And Raoul was there with us from the very beginning, working on this project. Uh, on the lower, um, uh, on the right side, we also see a third person in a picture, which is Emily Rauber Rodriguez uh, in her hard hat. Emily, shout out to Emily. She is one of our research assistants, wonderful research assistants for this project. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you. And also Manu uh, Kelly, Manushka uh, Labuba as well, which uh, was another research assistant on this project. It was really important as we were going through archives to dig deep, but also to verify and find names and dates. And that's why it was really important to have a solid team together mm -hmm. to be able to, um, to be able to find those lost, hidden, forgotten histories at times. And so to think about this exhibition was happening at the same time that, you know, the staff and the team are trying to build and construct the museum as well. So we're simultaneously looking for objects to and, con and trying to conceptualize this exhibition that wouldn't happen until the second iteration of a, t of a temporary exhibition while also dealing with construction and dealing with, you know, sort of ideas of the way in which the permanent collection and the permanent museum was going to, um, you know, sort of be transformed and, and opened up to various visitors. So for the, these curators and for Emily and for Manushka and for so many members of the team, you know, it was a little bit of, a, I guess, the schizophrenia because you're <laughs> building this while you're literally, um, while the, what's the phrase, you know, you're building it while it's flying at yeah. the same time. So there was a little bit of that, but we wanted to let you all know, you know, that we've been, this has been ongoing and it's been a project even while the the walls for the museum were still being built, yeah. we were working behind the scenes on this exhibition. Yeah, I think around this time our staff numbered around 30. Yeah. So you preceded a lot of departments. You yeah. came up with oh, the idea for the book, you know, before the publication team formed. All these things were happening at the same time. But it is exciting to look back that this project has been so foundational to this museum. Oh. Yes, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Let's summarize it. It was never boring, <laughs> <laughs> never ever <laughs> here at the Academy Museum, and it is still not, um, um, and it's still really exciting. One moment we wanted to highlight too is um, in 2018, we formed an advisory team uh, consisting of scholars and filmmakers. Um, and we had the wonderful opportunity to have everybody visit here. Uh, our advisors to this team. Um, are, um, let's, let's see, I'm walking from, from left to right here. You see Ria, Ria on the far left, then you see Sharla Lynch. She is a documentary filmmaker as well as a, a curator of the Schomburg Center. Then you see myself. Then afterwards, um, Michael Gillespie, who is a professor at New York City uh, University. Uh, then you see Ellen Scott, a professor at UCLA here in Los Angeles. Then you see our Jacqueline Stewart, who used to be a professor at Chicago, but now is our director and president at the Academy Museum, and we're really excited about that. <laughs> and then you see uh, Charles Burnett, the amazing filmmaker, Charles Burnett. 
and Ron Maliozzi, uh, who is a curator from MoMA, who has been invested in uh, mm -hmm. working on and discovering uh, early film history. Um, part of it you'll see also in our exhibition. Uh, and then you see our Raul Guzman. <laughs> And Ava DuVernay was also part of our advisory team, but she wasn't there at this one day, so she's not in the photograph, but she has been invested in our project all along as well. And then you'll see some different moments where we work together, we work together. I, I must, we really want to express our deep gratitude to our advisory team members because all of them brought so many elements to it. We built our exhibition on the scholarship of these amazing scholars and filmmakers that have been working in this field for many, many years and written some amazing books um, that we all, you know, read and cherished. And their insights and their knowledge was really instrumental for the developing development of our exhibition as well. And for us to have a sounding board, <laughs> um, to have a sounding board and also have people we can call upon when we had questions and need verifications or wanted somebody to, to run, uh, topic to run by was really, really important and instrumental. So I cannot thank our advisory team. And thank you, Jacqueline. <laughs> Enough for this great process we had together. Yeah, and then the research. The research, the research. It was so amazing to do that together. This, as we just put a few pictures together, we have thousands of pictures that we images that we collected in our research trips uh, to in our own Margaret Herrick Library at the Academy Museum, which you see an image here where we look at portraits um, of Hattie McDaniel, for example. Um, and then uh, this allowed us to choose, make a selection for our exhibition. But we I also wanted to mention that the whole project started at the Margaret, the seed of the project really started at, at the Margaret Herrick Library um, of the Academy. If you haven't been to that library, it's open to the public, it's free to visit. It's one of the best film libraries I know in the United States. Yes, shout out to the Margaret Herrick Library because they do such a good job there in keeping film history alive and make it as accessible to anybody who is interested in it. So, so we were interested in it and we saw posters and lobby cards um, of, of race films from the 1920s and 30s and 40s there. At that time it was Raoul and myself, we did not know Ria yet um, and we were both, I mean, uh, <laughs> The material was so electric. The, was so electric. We were, I mean, so excited, but also frustrated that we didn't know these films. A little bit of both, like the excitement of the material and the frustration. Why don't I know these films? Why don't we know these films? We should know them. What can we do to make them wider known? And so that was the seed for our project. That's how we started to develop it. And also that's how and when uh, soon after we reached out to Ria. Uh, when she was at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And from that on, really, the rest is history. And it means we went, it shows some of the places we went to. It took us to Blue, uh, Black Film Center Archive in Indiana, to um, exhibitions in Houston, Texas, to exhibitions in Atlanta, um, to, of course, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, along with other Smithsonian's institutions in DC. Um, of course, the Schomburg Center, a really important resource if you're interested in black culture to visit, also open to the public, it's part of the New York Public Library, along with MoMA and many other institutions, the Brooklyn Museum uh, were really important places for us to go to and visit. Then Ria and I had the great fortune to go to France as well, to visit the Cinémathèque Française and their collections. We found objects there that have never been they seen. They had never yeah. even pulled out of the yeah. drawer before. Yeah. You know, So we're looking at work from Hallelujah. We're looking at sketches that you will now see in the exhibition of Carmen Jones. They had literally had these, but you know, they did not have any purpose, use, or understand what they had. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until Doris and I showed up that they were like, oh, okay, wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah. And we were able to pull those. But that's the key thing about as for cur curators, the process, it's always the objects. It's, it's really key to sort of, you get a lot of your ideas. You can have sort of conceptual 
ways in which you want to organize uh, the space, but you're ultimately telling a story through space, you know, using and creating kind of an experiential um, opportunities for people to understand these kind of bigger, larger, sometimes um, wind, um, broad and winding uh, concepts. And usually you're trying to find an object that can help you to tell a multifaceted and layered story. And so this is a part of the reason why it was critical for us to go when we could, in the before times, uh, to yeah. the uh, traveling and see a lot of these objects because you can you can sort of see and feel the history and the and the sort of stories that are entangled with you know who held this who um, who illustrated this what were the context and the dynamics and some of that you're not going to see simply if you see it online and and sort of read through a finding aid you have to go and visit and that was really sort of critical for us mm -hmm. and one of those objects is when in berlin in germany mm -hmm. you know you saw yeah. i had heard about this piece of that uh, with respect to paul robeson that he had been surveilled way before his passport had been revoked. This is, you know, Paul Robeson, for those who may be less familiar, is an actor, activist, someone who was committed from um, his early days. He got his start in the 1925, body and, well, film star, Body and Soul from Oscar Micheaux. And he, but he was very clear that acting and activism were sort of who he was in terms of a performer. How, and he traveled Europe. He was, you know, um, committed. Or he was a communist. He he adhered to many communist values, and um, and he also challenged the ways in which America uh, treated black people. Quite frankly, and um, we had heard through some family, some of his Robeson family members, that he had been surveilled early in his career. I talked to Doris about it. She was go on her way to Europe, went to Germany, asked the archivist again. They didn't know anything about it, similar to Cinematheque Francaise, not really knowing about things. And then we go and she sees something, yeah, right? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a chilling revelation, I would say, because um, in the Federal Archives of Berlin in Germany, um, I found a document that showed that Paul Robeson was surveyed by the Nazis in 1937, before World War II already. Can you imagine this? And, and so it, we have, we have this in the exhibition now, reproduction of that card, where they, they showed that they followed him, you know, into different places. He went to diff, a, a city in Germany, Aachen, to London, to Moscow in 1937. So, I mean, that was just really a new find for all of us. And, and it took a lot of like asking and what you just said, Ria, is exactly how we experienced so many moments. You hear something from somebody, you talk to a family member or another archivist, and then you start digging, but you might not know where to look first, right? So this is a process that takes time and um, it only comes out really if you talk to more people and one person talks to another person, the third person, the fourth person, and they eventually lead you to the right archive um, and, and you fill out the right forms. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of form filling, of form, <laughs> filling out forms in lots of languages and countries. <laughs> but it also, I think, that, that card, right? And this is the thing about curating in terms of what a, an object can do to tell a story. It speaks to sort of the responsibility, the power, the negotiation mm -hmm. that a lot of black performers had to contend with um, as they chose this craft, this fine art. They want to be on screen. They want to tell, you know, sort of show off their amazing or their talents, if you will, help tell these rich stories. But there's always this, sort of, you know, there's surveillance. There is, you know, this other sort of cultural, social, historical responsibility that is also um, sort of part of the, <laughs> you know, reality of being a black person uh, in not only this country, but in, in the world. And what that has, it has different meanings. It has different um, signification. And that card, I think, really sort of 
speaks very mm -hmm. dynamically about that delicate responsibility and delicate dance. Indeed, yeah. Um, so, yeah. speaking of archives. Yeah, we are seeing a few more pictures of a few more archives to show you how archives look like. That Raoul is sitting in the Black Film Center archive with gloves on, <laughs> right? So also really important. Sometimes the objects are delicate and old, so you don't want to leave fingerprints. Um, that was an important moment. Um, yeah, these just uh, images yeah. to give you some visualizations. I know we have to move on a little bit. Yeah, yes, and this is, uh, these are a few pictures from part of our trips at the Schomburg Center together with Charla Lynch and Ria and myself. And then our amazing trip to, <laughs> to the south of France to visit Josephine Baker's castle. Josephine Baker owned this castle. And um, it was a really enriching oh, trip for both of us, mind blowing. From inspiring. East St. Louis to here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not yes. bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it had its ebbs and flows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then eventually, one thing we wanted to bring up too, because we have in our exhibition also artworks, visual artworks that we included into the materials of uh, film, film materials. And that was important to us because we had the opportunity to visit many, many different, this is just a portion of the exhibitions that we have visited of, um, um, of uh, black artists from the 20th century um, and with different points of views and different topics but it was a really enriching research period for us that included visual arts and that from very early on we kind of knew we wanted to include that into our exhibition as well and so the research also means you go and see other exhibitions and that was really important uh, as part of our research project. Yeah, and once we started amassing all this material over the first few years, we really started to give shape um, to the different sections that you see upstairs. There are seven galleries. Really creating film exhibitions is, I think, a delicate dance of finding the right objects, displaying the right film clips, you know, thinking about the sound in the gallery. How will lighting enhance all the material? You know, what can we show? Uh, how do we write about it in the didactics? How do we illustrate it with quotes and really I think it's been a wonderful journey to give shape to all this material after so many years and like really seeing, you know, the power that these objects has and can have when visitors really get a chance to see them. So here we are uh, in our lower level of the museum with our uh, designer, uh, uh, Shraddha Arial, head of uh, design and production at the museum. She's been, you know, designing the temporary exhibitions for, for us. Um, and I remember this workshop because it was really interesting to see, you know, how our thinking was translated into space with, with Shraddha's uh, help. Um, so in the top uh, corner, you see the layout. And we started adding where the montages were going to be, like where were the artworks that we wanted to have, um, you know, what was the primary audio experience we wanted in the gallery, thinking about colors, what did the material evoke, uh, really thinking about all that and how that would give shape. And then at the bottom, you see uh, a shot of the, the model. Um, once we kind of had a good layout, our team was able to really create a three-dimensional model. And we've been using them now for the two exhibitions that have been designed in-house. And they really are a great tool for us to really see, you know, what's the viewpoint going to be as you enter uh, from one gallery to the next. Um, that's been really key, I think, in creating a dynamic exhibition that uh, presents each of the themes in kind of a very unique way, I think. And it's and interesting it's because, you know, in your mind, you can think something looks is going to be great and you can, you know, kind of think, yes, this is fabulous. And then when you get into the practical, you start looking at it from a 3D, from a model standpoint, it's like, that's not going to work. How is that going to you know, what is the story? How are people going to understand the message? Does this message actually make sense here? So a lot of things that we end up having to do is, you know, a lot of curating is editing, it's selecting, it's being really, really, um, you know, a, um, deliberate and intentional around sort of what is the overarching message. Mm -hmm. And it's, but here you see from kind of two dimensionality to three dimensionality yeah. and, um, and the sort of stages in between. And this is definitely a team effort. Curators are here on this stage, but we could literally have a, 
orchestra, a mm -hmm. chorus of individuals yeah. or teams that has really helped us. I'm sorry, Doris, yeah. you were mm -hmm. going to say. Yeah, exactly. And, and what I always like to compare or distinguish telling stories in different formats, right? Is exhibition making is very specific. Mm -hmm. It's so different than writing a book. If you write a book or if you make a film, it's also different um, because you need to tell your story in a physical space. And exactly to what Ria said and Raoul mentioned before, you have to kind of imagine that three-dimensional space with the objects in different dimensions, scales, thickness, uh, color, vibrancies in mind to understand if you can tell that, how you can tell that story, which is very different than when you write a book because you are focused on your language and, and the narrative components of it, which is part of exhibition making too, once you write the labels and you know that you can read the exhibition, but it's, it, it starts on a different level and, and it's, it's really tactile, really, at, at some moments in time. That's what I really love about it. Um, and there's a hierarchy, too. You can look at, if you all have had the pleasure of going through the space, you could kind of consider uh, the scale, you know, a scale of something, and that, that may have a diff that's going to have a different prominence to you as the visitor experiencing it being engulfed by it, understanding it. The lights also will then help you to sort of hone in on a particular object. Um, the way in which the, the subsection text, the text, that versus the label, all of these things, you know, from a curatorial standpoint, are literally on these sheets in some way, shape, or form, um, and they become translated into the, you know, the final product. But it's though all of so from the macro to the micro is uh, part of what you're seeing here and what we have had to kind of uh, negotiate over yes. the last five and a half years. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, at the end of it, there's you know the physical space and. We saw thousands of objects during our research mm -hmm. phase, and how do we hone it down to the objects that you see on view? Um, and really, you know, the design of the exhibition is meant to highlight these amazing objects that each have their own unique story. Um, we went, you know, to Western Costume as we were doing research for the core exhibition, and, you know, mm -hmm. we were able to see that they had three altered uh, dresses from Stormy Weather that were reused after the film um, that's why they look a little different and in a private collector we found um, the amazing mm -hmm. gown that you see upstairs and this project was you know uh, a lot of hours for our conservation team to really uh, be able to uh, stabilize the dress so that it would be ready for display so that it could you know the threading was very um, falling apart uh, we ended up also going to the Autry to see you know amazing material from their collection about the Norman Film Company and really thinking about how we uh, design and present these these works thinking of the mannequin poses and the you know how are we gonna light them as well has been really I think a, a joy um, and I'll, I'll just it was it's very difficult I think one of the things we're super excited about with regeneration is that we are sort of regenerating, bringing to the fore, um, I, not only stories and people, that some that are more known than others, but costumes like this, I, you know, to, to triangulate, to confirm, to authenticate that this is the actual dress that Lena Horne wore, um, or that these were the actual costumes from the stormy weather is, Again, the credit to Emily and to Raul and so many of our other teammates because and you know Doris that because what would happen often is when a African after sort of a production a black cast production it got reused for someone else it wasn't like you know a Greta Garbo or whomever that you find these works and they're they're sort of held in. Um, sort of perpetuity and 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 regaled in the same way, and so it did take a lot of digging to to authenticate and make sure that this is the actual dress that uh, Lena Horne wore, uh, and so it's just not it, it's a, a really exciting moment for us to include these works here because um, and, and even with the Porgy and Bess piece with Sammy yeah. Davis, it has his name still there, yeah. which was super cool for us yeah. to see. Uh, but that's a that's a rarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Many of the times these things were reused, re-altered, and then they're they're lost. Yeah. So um. 
And we continued with our mock-ups. Um, this, I think, was a really exciting phase to actually see things constructed. Uh, the media, I think, was a critical component of this mm -hmm. exhibition. We wanted to ensure that there was mat the material we wanted to include was in you know the best shape uh, possible. So we tested. Sometimes we wouldn't be able to get the right source material, so we were testing alternates, uh, thinking about how large they would be. Uh, was I think really critical uh, part of the exhibition because after all we really wanted to highlight you know these performances that you know captivated audiences for you know so many years. Um, here we have uh, in the bottom image you see uh, us testing the different vitrines. We were really interested in getting the right angles. Um, we were doing testing um, for ADA, um, really thinking about you know how uh, can we make everything legible um, for our visitors. We also did open captions for all our montages, so people with um, listen. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was really important for us, and, and we do that for all our media in the museum um, to really be able to create experiences that are welcoming to all our visitors. Um, so really, this phase um, also um, allowed us to also test the AR components that we have in the mm -hmm. exhibition. We have two AR experiences that really enhanced um, uh, or were really kind of great avenues for all, of, all the research that we did. Um, one is based on the production maps of um, the race film companies, and the other is glamour wall photography, adding biographical information to these amazing actors. Mm -hmm. So that was really critical uh, during this time, being able to test all this, all these to make sure that everything was really working cohesively. Mm -hmm. One thing still about the montages I wanted to mention, because that's also so different from creating um, exhibitions in the fine art world, right? Um, when you do film, when you create film exhibitions, you work with the material of film, which is a time-based medium. So we watched, I don't know how many hundreds of hours of film uh, together, <laughs> or, or, or in our own hundreds. <laughs> yes, uh, if that cuts it, I don't even know. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> um, and to decide which which ones we want to include in the exhibition and which component of a 90 minute film, which two minutes do we want to include in the exhibition that speaks to the topic that we find really important to make? Uh, and then how do we combine it with the next film? You know, how does the transition go? I mean, that is a big editing job too. So a big shout out to a few people here. One is Manushka Kelila Buba, who helped us through this process of sourcing and creating this together. Together. I don't know if she's here, but thank you, Manushka. Um, and then also to our AV production team, Absolutely. because without a good AV production team, you cannot pull that off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see them sort of making sure the aspect ratio, trying to sort out how we're how big or you know wide we need to, to create for um, our montage for the stars and icons section uh, in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, you know, part of what we're, again, this idea of regeneration, this title became um, not only, a, you know, the example of, uh, of Toddy Pictures film from 1923 that was the inspiration for the exhibition, but it also became kind of the metaphor, the affirmation, the aspiration for us with this whole exhibition. You know, we want to regenerate the ways in which we understand American cinema. We want to regenerate the ways in which we think about um, film and black participation in this industry. Um, but we also want to regenerate the ways in which we um, sort of pull together projects and programs and, and other material around this um, wonderful or this exhibition. So one of the ways in which we um, are doing that is through a publication. Uh, and this was the cover that we, after many, many tries and many attempts and many conversations, so um, we, we, we settled on, on this kind of what we thought would have a topography that looks at sort of the past, if you will, a sort of a, but it's also bold, yet and still that pink gives us this sort of nod to a very contemporary and energetic kind of um, sort of push 
forward. So it gives us this, uh, so there was a, it was not an easy task, but it was something that we really sort of are, feel very proud about. Yeah. So this is the cover of our exhibition catalog. For those who have not gotten one, please go to our bookstore and uh, mm -hmm. encourage you to pick one up. Um, and in that, we wanted to, again, as Doris mentioned in the very beginning, that sort of quote from um, Baldwin, again, carried us through uh, the, the way in which we kind of also conceptualize the book. We wanted to not only honor the past, but really sort of think about how these, um, you know, these, these pioneers from, um, from our past have really inspired uh, our contemporary conversations around black filmmaking. So we, we reached out and we were, had the fortunate opportunity to interview um, a, Academy Award winner Barry Jenkins, who talked to us about um, really something very similar to what Charles Burnett, another sort of Academy member, mentioned that they don't, they did not in their film school training learn about the, these topics, you know, so they were really sort of speaking to us about the importance of this exhibition and, and what it may have meant to them in terms of their film career uh, and what they could have thought was even more possible yeah. knowing th this material. So they really grounded us in another way in terms of the relevance of this historic information for a contemporary audience and they and they situate that so we have interviews not only with Barry Jenkins not only with Charles Burnett um, but and and I must say that this Charles Burnett photograph really is so significant for the two of all of us because this literally was what like five days mm -hmm. before the world shut down um, for COVID. So we met with Barry fairly early on, uh, and then we then had this this meeting with Charles Burnett, and then after that, it was Zoom interviews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were able to interview with Don Porter. Um, Ava DuVernay and you know, Julie Dash. And we were so grateful that they had the time and opportunity to do that. But it sort of really does also speak to, you know, the, the duration of this project um, and how we've had to not only travel across, um, you know, the country and the, and the um, internationally and nationally for archives, but we've also had to curate through a pandemic, a global <laughs> health crisis. Um, yeah. and, um, but again, so grateful that we have that element in the, the book. And the process <laughs> of, of creating a nearly 300 page publication, um, at the same time you're opening up a museum, at the yeah. same time you're going through a global pandemic, and at the same time that you're creating the exhibition itself. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps we are. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say we're ambitious, others might say we're sadomasochist. I don't know, yeah, it depends yeah. on the day. Uh, but we spent many, many hours uh, in, you know, uh, Doris's home, <laughs> digging through, kind of trying to, because the museum was closed. I mean, or at least staff were not able to, you know, kind of come and gather. So we had to find safe spaces to kind of deal with and literally go through. Right now, we're kind of going through the galleys of the, the, um, the book, trying to double check, back check, all of this. So you see daylight, you see nighttime. You can see <laughs> the whole, it was a, a long, long hours. journey. Um, and then, but then, you know, so, but we're here now and, and we were so thrilled that we were able to be at the space of install. So when you're installing, they had to take down uh, the Miyazaki exhibition for those who had the opportunity and privilege to see that. And then you start again with a full blank slate. Um, and it's a whole team, you know, again, Sh and Shrada uh, and her team, we have the fabricators that are working behind the scenes, pulling everything together, sourcing all of the material well in advance so that when this day comes, they're able to paint, pull together, use that sort of mock-up model to get, you know, um, as, a, as a way to, as a blueprint, if you will, to sort of source the ways in which we're going to lay out the space. And that took uh, several weeks, if you will. That's a whole, it was really like a month process, a month long process to get from zero to completion. 
and you see again, the team is in there. Our art handlers um, are installing uh, the work from Glenn Ligon's piece to sort of laying out how we want to, to situate the, the glamour wall to putting up the posters. We even had Gary Simmons, you see at the balcony, the sort of the sculptural piece. Um, his studio manager came through along with um, the manager from his gallery represent, re, rep came as well to help. It's again, a team effort. While we're up here, we cannot do this mm -hmm. without the host of so many people, um, not with the help of so many people, um, pulling together the Kara Walker. You see everyone bundled up in the corner <laughs> trying to make sure using the blueprints that they yeah. lay out and then these stencils, these silhouettes that they have to lay out individual one by one to get that together. Um, team is sort of, again, they have the vision of the title wall, but now you have to sort of apply that. And, and, and once you're in a space, you know, all of those sort of conceptual theoretical things have to then be tweaked and adjusted according to the space. And, and you're trying to think through these things beforehand, but where's the light going to hit it? All of these little details become um, sort of adjusted in real time as you're doing the installation. But for us, this is like, you know, we are... We can see the light where the finish line is near and you're just so excited. This is just incredible and exciting um, times to just, you're just bursting with joy. Uh, and so just to sort of break down, I just wanted to give you all, as for those who have seen it or haven't, it's an 11,000 square foot space that we were, we had to work with. Seven galleries is what we decided upon. You open up, as we talked about before, with 1898 and Something Good, Negro Kiss, along juxtaposed with Glenn Ligon's Double America Two to kind of talk about that tension, to discuss the way, uh, the tension of black participation in the moving, in, uh, moving industry, film industry, um, the art form of the ways in which um, black people had to negotiate and navigate um, their presence with, with the backdrop of racism, of limited opportunities, of uh, prejudice, of stereotypical uh, sort of presentations predominating the ways in which uh, African Americans were being seen in still images as, as well as in moving imagery. So we wanted to sort of challenge that preconceived notion that in the late 19th century, there were still these amazing vaudeville performers who were doing incredible work and being very conscientious about the ways in which they wanted to present a, mod, a sort of a black modernity, a, mo, a sort of themselves in the ways in which, you know, thinkers like Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, and W.E.D. E.B. Du Bois were thinking about what it meant to be black, what blackness looked like, felt like, was. And so they want, so we really conscientiously wanted to start with challenging these pre sort of dominant prejudiced stereotypical notions of, of blackness. And you then walk into an early cinema room with this incredible sweeping piece of silhouette work by Carol Walker um, that kind of looks at the power, the again, talking about scale of popular culture. And that's in conversation with uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, which is what Kara Walker's work is kind of challenging and critiquing so that you can see that there's been African Americans from time and even contemporarily challenging these preconceived kind of notions around sort of blackness and, and what it means. And so it was really important for us to, to sort of situate all of that in this early section uh, and then highlight some of the incredible Filmmakers and, and excuse me, film sort of actors, performers like uh, Sam Lucas or even Burt <laughs> Williams. Uh, so you see all of that uh, and kind of get the context of what is at stake. Uh, and then you move into race films and you look at the ways in which black performers responded to them. performers and directors, artists responded to that. So that's what you kind of understand when you move into this, the um, sort of the second section of it. Uh, and here you also have a black box theater. So these things um, kind of really give you the, the groundwork for you to then move into another section that looks at 
race and um, music, music and film. And then you go on to stars and arc icons to kind of talk about the ways in which participation um, kind of transformed and different people um, sort of participated over the years from a Lena Horne to a Sidney Poitier to a Paul Robeson uh, and Josephine Baker uh, and Freddie Washington. You have here this wonderful object that we've collected of the Soundy machine that the Academy Museum acquired um, to highlight the ways in which um, various individuals were being shown on video mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. MTV, if you will. So this kind of gives you that breadth and, the, and it's chronological but as well as thematic. Mm -hmm. So that was another sort of winding journey that you receive when you go through these seven galleries culminating in the 70s with this kind of spirit of black power, of independence, of agency um, that then we think sort of catapulted many other um, filmmakers like the ones you will read about in the book. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to mention too, in which our project Regeneration also allowed us at the Academy Museum to uh, increase our object base uh, at, the, at, the, at our collections to make them more um, diverse, really. And, and the project like Regeneration gave us a very good, we didn't need an excuse, but that gave us even a very good platform to do so, to go shopping, as well, <laughs> yeah, if you, you will. Go you know, so I'm gonna, and we will continue to do so. So this was just the first step, and this has opened doors now for us to, to make sure that our collections are more inclusive and diverse moving forward. And just find, lastly, you know, it was we were so thrilled that part of the regeneration efforts also meant um, preserving and restoring films that had been previously considered lost. So the Academy Film Archive was able to preserve, through the generous support of many sponsors, Harlem on the Prairie, um, Reform School, and Mr. Washington Goes to Town. Each uh, Harlem on the Prairie is what, a Western, if you will? So they also in different genres. Reform School is a, a drama. Mm -hmm. And then you have Mr. Washington Goes to Town, uh, which is a comedy. Uh, and we feature all of them in the montage for the Black Box Theater. And then the National Museum of African American History and Culture was able to restore and preserve a film that had been considered lost. Um, it kind of gotten overshadowed by Sweet Sweet Back. They were done around the same time, but it went um, a different, had a different trajectory. Uh, so we were so thrilled that we were able to identify it, find it, and then we're able to restore it and show it. And it'll be screened here, a premiere, I think, for the first time in 50 years as part of the pro public programming. So please come for that. Thank you for coming, Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.